Hi, this is Rahman Sheikh. Welcome to Fortnightly Railway Transportation Systems Podcast. I am the host and railway systems specialist working in this industry for 24 years and counting. This podcast is primarily focused on railway experts who have vast amount of experience and contributed greatly to this amazing industry. This is not a technical seminar, but focuses on feel-good stories, individual journeys, their success and failures, motivating younger generation to kickstart their career in railways and creating a sense of pride for the railway people who devoted their lives on the most environment-friendly public transportation. Our guest for this fortnight is Patrick Yole, Director, Safety Assurance Technical Access Advisory, Sydney. Patrick started his career as an avionics systems engineer in British Aerospace Defence Limited. Patrick is a chartered engineer with 30 years experience of engineering safety management, ESM, rail telecommunications and safety assurance in the UK and Australia. Patrick has working knowledge of safety standards and guidelines, including Yellow Book IESM, European CSM, CENILAC EN 5126, 5128, 5129, 5159, International IEC 61508 and ISO 31000, LUL and UK Network Rail Standards, equally familiar with Australian rail legislation and standards through roles in Western Australia, New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria. Hi, Patrick. Welcome to Railway Transportation Systems Podcast. Hi, Raymond. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure and an honour. Patrick, can you please introduce yourself? Sure. So, uh, Patrick Yule, been an engineer for almost 30 years. Currently work for a consultancy based in Sydney called Access Advisory, a director of safety technical. So, can you briefly tell us about your professional journey as well? Sure, yeah. So, uh, for me, becoming an engineer started as a boy watching my father make and repair things. For example, things like uh, repairing TVs, radios, watches. I used to make furniture. I used to watch him build, weld and race. Bang uh, stock cars. Uh, I watched him build our family's house extension. So yeah, started off with the germination of an idea to become an engineer and went to university, Warwick University. One of the third year's courses was called High Integrity Systems. That covered safety analysis and accident investigations relating to helicopters and passenger aircraft disasters. And I think along with always having an interest in aircraft as a boy, we used to have family outings to uh, fill in the air show in South Yorkshire. So I think that's what probably what influenced me starting off initially with British Aerospace as a graduate. But I then soon moved to British Rail Research, where I, I developed my technical knowledge of the railways and ended up focusing on telecoms and the safety assurance as a result of encouragement and mentors from various people I used to work for at the companies I was employed at. Wow, great, great intro and short and crisp as usual a safety assessors would do in their comments. Before I move into my series of questions, can you tell us in brief, what is the role of independent safety assessor, ISA, in rail industry? Sure, so, uh, well, just a bit of history. So from my experience, independent safety assessors started to become involved in the UK in the early to mid 1990s. About that time, that for me, that was when uh, safety assurance and safety cases started to be produced for new systems, configuration changes to the railway. So the projects would be having to produce safety assurance documentation. And at that time, quite a few companies who emerged who uh, performed independent safety assessment. I think that might have been partly prompted by the uh, the approval panels at the time. So there would always be a separate approval panel. Initially, they were called like safety sh- safety assessment panels and then it became system review panels after privatisation of British Rail to uh, to rail track. And yeah, it was effectively an independent opinion on the adequacy of the uh, safety assurance submissions. And of course, at that time, having known from experience and working on projects on the delivery side, there's always been an independent internal, independent verification and checking of safety cases. Independent safety assessor provides that kind of final, typically separate organisation, independent Independent opinion. Budgets and time tend to be limited, so the the independent safety assessor, also known as an ISA, they can only really do a, a sample assessment and generally t- typical 
criteria or to an independent review to, to ensure that best practice has been followed, compliance with any applicable standards and legislation. Beautiful. Pat, looking into your intro and your professional career, mainly in system safety, can you tell us, according to you, which country has high safety standards, Australia or UK? Okay, that's good. That's good trick question. So in Australia, the legislation is safety risks uh, must be reduced as far as is reasonably practicable. So that's known as SAFARP for short. Whereas in the UK, it's uh, risks to be reduced as low as reasonably practicable. So that's known as ALARP. Uh, There is a subtle difference in terms of the uh, the legal test. Uh, To be be honest, I I, I seem to remember there was an institution webinar. It's probably still available on the uh, safety and reliability Society website, which talks specifically about the differences between uh, uh, SAFARP in Australia and ALARP in the UK. From recollection, SAFARP is subtly slightly more onerous in terms of the legal test for what what is uh, so far as reasonable versus as low as reasonably practicable. And yeah, from my experience, also it's not not just the, uh, the legislation, but also in in the UK, there's uh, quite a large volume of railway group standards and network rail as a national operator have their own network rail standards. London Underground Metro, they have their own standards. From my experience, there's more standards in the UK compared to standards in the various states in Australia. But I would say that from my experience, that safety standards, knowledge and skills are shared between the two countries. So there isn't really, a, for me, a significant difference in terms of one being safer than the other. Wow. So ALAP is used in the UK and SAPARP is used in Australia. So both the key difference, what's the key technical difference in these two is it safety or is it cost no, I think it's both. I think in terms of cost, that they're both extremely similar. At some point, in terms of the test for what is reasonably or as low as reasonably practicable, for for risk control measures to be discounted as not being reasonable, both countries, I think they have their own equivalent, like a, there's a, effectively like a benchmark figure for what what a fatality cost cost benefit for a fatality, and typically the co- cost for implementing a, a risk control needs to be an order of magnitude greater greater than the safety benefit. So they have different figures for the UK and Australia, but uh, generally it's still similar enough that for me, there's not a significant difference in terms of the test. From my experience, to demonstrate either risks of SAFARP or ALARP, there has to be an extremely good, compelling reason to not implement a a risk control, whether it be uh, a change to a a design, engineering change, or eliminating a risk. It needs to be a a clear, compelling case for why it's not reasonable. So they're both similar in that respect, from my opinion. If I have to apply these two across the other parts of the world apart from UK and Australia whether it might be Middle East India Malaysia anywhere which is easier to adopt SAFA or ALAP for the same reasons I've said before I, I would say uh, the difference is so marginal that uh, I don't think for me having worked in both UK Europe and Australia for me there's not a noticeable significant difference in one being easy and the other but they're both equally onerous and they should be onerous in, in terms of because ultimately it's about risk reduction under rail safety national law. Thanks, Pat. Great insights. Major confusion cleared. I know your job is very critical. What are the some of the challenges you face as safety assessor? Yeah, so there's a, there's a few challenges. I think the, these apply to the independent assessors rather than actual challenges in terms of dealing with projects. So one is as the independent assessor seeking to remain objective and focusing on observations that are based on risk reduction. So what that means is avoiding as the eyes are providing, you know, tr- trying to uh, impart their su- the eyes a subjective opinion on how, how a particular document or design should be. Uh, and the focus should be about risk reduction. One good benchmark or good practice benchmark benchmark for that is the International Engineering Safety Management uh, Guidance Note 4. So that's also known as IESM. Uh, So the uh, IESM uh, manual actually originated in the UK 
from the UK rail industry, Yellow Book. I've known quite a few of the authors from my time since British Rail, and that provides, to me, a benchmark that all independent assessors should seek to follow. One of the challenges, uh, because the independent assessors independent, we should avoid or shouldn't be influenced in, in any way by a program or cost pressures. So that helps if, uh, if the eyes is an independent organisation, but it could equally be an internal independent assessor within an organisation. But the challenge there is to avoid compromising independence, but at the same time, ultimately, there's a common goal. We still need to achieve an efficient and timely assessment to approval gate deadlines we need to be independent of that. One other challenge, this is a probably more difficult one in my opinion, trying to identify a new projects and preempting any credible, unpredictable, low frequency catastrophic events. So for that, what one one way to help with that is to uh, as a independent assessors is to be across and be aware of all the latest published accident investigation reports from around the world and the lessons learned that come out of the investigations, both historic and recent. But yeah, by their nature, a lot of these low frequency catastrophic events they tend to be caused by systematic failures, uh, often inv- involving humans, and that's difficult to predict and preempt. These are quite great challenges, especially to avoid those catastrophic incidents. To overcome these challenges and as a part of safety assessment, which tools do you use in daily routine and what's your opinion on AI in safety, artificial intelligence? Yeah, so yeah, in terms of artificial intelligence, uh, I'm a big fan of Stanley Kubrick and I love the film 2001 Space Odyssey. There seems to be a lot of hysteria in my opinion in the media about artificial intelligence. I have a positive opinion of AI where it can help uh, cure diseases, help manage climate change. The other reason I have a positive opinion is because on the railways, in the railway industry, we've had artificial intelligence for over 50 years. So for example, uh, we've had automatic train operation on the Victoria line of London Underground since 1968. So that's driverless trains and but person I was involved in terms of being employed by British Rail Research and in the late 1980s, automatic route setting developed. So yeah, as far as, far as I'm concerned, uh, we've had artificial intelligence on the railways uh, for 50 years and I have a, have a positive view for it, of it in terms of its success in the railways. How about the tools? Yeah, so for tools, uh, so I've got personal experience from the company I work for at the moment, that's advisory. So we, we developed a web-based tool called Isashore. Uh, uh, and it, the objective is to automate and help some of the, there's a lot of manual data handling uh, associated with being an independent safety assessor. So, for example, we typically capture all our safety observations in safe notices that involves top typing typically a, a pro form or a template in Microsoft Word. We then use a spreadsheet in Microsoft Excel to manage and track all the observations and different categories of observations and then we also have to use a, a, either our own or, a, or the client's document management system and then transmit safe notices via email. So this tool was because it was web based it was aiming to automate and uh, make it more efficient to manage that process that's probably the, the main tool that i can think of for either work well great tools i help them make your job easy but does automation which you just spoke about uh, ato and atp does that help or make your job easy as a isa in terms of being the isa in my opinion yes the, the web-based tool i mentioned there is a lot of manual data handling typing up comments and then cutting and pasting into various documents so for that that aspect yes in terms of uh, my opinion on railway operations yes i think it does also benefit it automatic train operation and ai wherever it can help to uh, not so much eliminate but re- reduce potential for human error so for me and this is just my opinion but ha- having an automated system automatic train operation uh, that cooperates with the signaling to safely control trains for their movement authority ahead for me that's safer than relying on a human using their eyes and having to look at line side colored signals or or semaphore signals so you have a positive opinion 
the bugs. Yeah, I agree. I 100% concur with you. Being a signaling so-called specialist with 25 years experience, I agree with you. Automation does really help removing the human intervention into the critical circuits. Moreover, what instances made you shift from aerospace sector to rail sector? Yeah, so I initially started at British Aerospace. That was effectively a defence company working on the uh, Harrier jump jet aircraft, vertical lift and takeoff aircraft. So I was there in the early 90s, but at that time, that coincided with the collapse of the Soviet area, Iron Curtain, around Eastern Europe. And so I started to have a few concerns about my long-term career prospects in defence at that time. And also at that time, as a, just as a, a bit of background, I was always interested in railways. So as well as at aircraft and going to air shows, I remember as a, as a boy going on school trips and family trips to the National Railway Museum in York. So I was always interested in rail and spoke to a few guys who I worked with in British Aerospace who had come from the rail industry. And so I already knew the systems engineering approach that was used there and I felt confident that I could transfer my skills across. And yeah, just ended up just applying for for a job in the newspaper with British Rail Research. And uh, luckily, the, the guys who interviewed me, uh, I wouldn't say took a gamble, uh, were willing to give me an opportunity to prove myself in the railways. Wow, great industry. Lucky to have you here. I know the answer, but uh, which industry is the best, aerospace or railways? That's hard, actually, to be honest. That's like trying to, to ask a, a parent to compare which child they like better, <laughs> to be honest. Right, right. Yeah, I've, to be honest, uh, I would say I have a preference for rail in terms of the uh, compared to defence re- rail. Is there's a lot more change, a bit more interesting. My time in aerospace and defence that was also great and interesting. The pace of work and projects was uh, a bit slower so i found r- railways a lot more fast moving and uh, dynamic so if I, if I had to choose one it would probably be rail i guess yeah you did well moreover yeah. coming back to your core area of competency some serious question what are the key steps you think will be involved in hazard identification and risk assessment yeah so from my experience, actually, it's the uh, the most important aspect is the uh, the preparation and planning uh, that goes before uh, hazard identification risk assessment workshop. So the key steps, this is from my experience of the last, I guess, 30 years, have either been a, a facilitator or secretary or attendee at these hazard workshops. So one key step is defining the system or the change or the configuration change. So without a well-defined system and system boundary, any hazard or risk assessment could otherwise be invalid and also in terms of the safety assurance planning so a key aspect of that is uh, preparing the briefing note which describes the scope uh, methodology agenda and the key thing is the quorum of attendees uh, so typically that needs to be the, the stakeholders end users operators maintainers also the designers discipline experts for example like human factors or if it was a signaling project uh, signaling design managers etc another key aspect again is the preparation by the facilitator and also by the attendees at the hazard and risk workshop is key to make it efficient that attendees prepare in advance and then when it actually then, then comes to because of all that preparation the actual hazard identification risk workshop from my experience that that is more of a relatively straightforward exercise because of all the preceding planning that's gone into it lots of critical steps involved before your certification what if something missed in the definition or at a system assurance planning phase? Yes, that's a good question. I think ultimately, if there's been a gap or deficiency that's found, and that might actually be, for example, so assuming this has done risk assessment exercise has been documented and then eventually gets submitted to an approval panel or gets reviewed by the independent safety assessor. If it's picked up, then ultimately it means rework, having to go through the same cycle again uh, for preparing and having another workshop. So ideally, I know from my experience in the UK, the European common safety method is applied. So the actual system def- definition phase, it's common safety method legislation is fairly prescriptive and onerous. There's lots of checks that are done from memory when I was working in network rail. There's even a, a pro forma with like guide word questions and comments on the various sections of the system definition document. So there's a lot of effort and guidance at the start 
to, to ensure that the system definition is correctly defined. And, uh, but yeah, ultimately, otherwise, yeah, it requires uh, almost starting again and reinventing the wheel and having to redo the hazard risk workshop. Yeah, I think what I understand is if there is a change and ISA picked it up at the final stage of the project, I believe the delivery team or the project director won't be happy in the assurance team, not just ISA, in the assurance team, will your team looking back often to, to check that nothing is missed and everything is on the right track? Yes. A lot of the projects we work on here, the independent safety assessor, not just us as the ISA, but there's the internal stakeholders. So for example, if it was a, if the client, for example, was like Transport for New South Wales, we know that there's already a, a, an independent team also reviewing the same documentation. They may not be ISAs, but a lot of them have got similar experience in railway backgrounds. We also have like typically on projects of in Australia, we have independent certifiers also checking and, and reviewing, not always having necessarily the exact same scope, but there's like multiple levels of checks, professional review of documents. And yeah, ultimately to, it may require rework if uh, one party finds an issue that and it can't be resolved because ultimately if it's an independent safety assessor um, and we're seeking to we must comply with legislation that risks to reduce as far as is reasonably practical, uh, then there can't be any mitigation or argument for having to uh, implement a change if, it, if that's what's required to a design or the system in order to reduce the risks acceptably. Great answers, Pat. Thanks for sharing that. Let's talk about the trends. What are the some of the latest trends in safety technology? We just spoke about AI and what are the other things? Yeah, so I just mentioned earlier, automatic train operation. Although having, having said that, that's not really new. But yeah, it feels like the trends at the moment in terms of railway projects worldwide are automatic train operation and then the implementation of European Rail Traffic Management System, ERTMS, and it's uh, as part of that is the European Train Control System, even as ETCS, other countries and railways around the world, if they're not in- implementing that, then they're also introduced implementing communication-based train control, also known as CBTC. Uh, so for me, those, those things are the uh, trends, if you like. Uh, they're not really like new. I think all those concepts have been around for arguably 20 or 30 years yeah I'll, i think if any listeners want any further information on uh, the european train control system or cbtc i would recommend the institution of railway signal engineers attending the there's various meetings events publications online webinars for those who prefer going on linkedin i would recommend doc frank's page it provides a good explanation and introduction to uh, those trends i've just mentioned etcs and cbtc yeah i think doc frank has been on my podcast i've been on his LinkedIn page and he's delivering some great amazing uh, training for global audience not just for signaling even non-signaling people I would highly recommend Doc Frank and uh, before I end up what's your one piece of advice to our listeners please okay so in, in advance of our podcast uh, Rahim I did provide a, a quotation from Douglas Adams now, that was a, a common mistake that people make when trying to design something completely foolproof is to underestimate the ingenuity of complete fools. So I think the advice in relation to that is actually uh, the projects and the designers consider human behavior and human integration in the design, operation and maintenance of systems. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. It's a great, great piece of advice coming from a quote and I love quotes as you have noticed. Thank you for your time, Pat. You're welcome. I believe everyone listening to this podcast has got something to take away from today's discussion. If you like this podcast, please listen, follow and share this podcast within your network. If you believe we should be sharing your story or someone within your network, there is a railway leader who should be here sharing his or her contribution to this industry. Contact me on railwaytransportationsystems at gmail.com. Thank you for your time today. See you next fortnight. Until then, stay safe and take care of yourself.